This is supposedly the original staircase from the house. If so, that would make it nearly 300 years old and assuming it's been used 20 times a day, that's over 2 million journeys up and down. So you can understand the condition it's in. The design is called a housed stringer and is simple but incredibly strong when tight. Unfortunately, over the centuries, these joints have loosened and it's clearly no longer fit for purpose. But modern power tools will make this design even more accurate and a lot more durable. So we decided to copy it like for like in New Oak. But the first job, as always, was demolition. Some of you will have noticed that there weren't any handrails when we began. There were at one point, but we'd ripped them out a few years ago to put in a new first floor. We still have the oak newel posts, which they connect into. This is the enormous middle one, and they're all in pretty good condition, so hopefully we'll be able to reuse them later on. Not only were we going to rebuild both flights of stairs, we also needed to put in a completely new landing. This was because back when we redid the first floor of the house, we increased its height to include sound insulation, so you wouldn't hear someone moving around in the room above you. This meant that the stairs now had to finish higher than previously, and to keep everything consistent and symmetrical, we had to make this middle landing higher.
Good trip. The original landing beam was fixed at one end to this upright post with a mortise and tenon joint and the other end just went straight into a hole in the wall. It's too low for the new landing so it needed to be cut out and replaced. Once we had the landing out, we needed to repair this back wall. As you saw, the ends of the original joists had also sat into holes in the wall, which isn't great. Instead, we chose to pour a concrete wall plate. It's quick, easy, and won't be seen. First, you have to set up shuttering to form the concrete, and these clever little things are called Dutch pins.
Once you have concrete in your formwork, you've got to use a rod of some sort to make sure it gets into every little nook and cranny. The next day. So this project was quite challenging to film. I had to buy a super wide angle lens to capture the narrow space. And after seeing some of the footage on my computer, I realized that lighting was not adequate. So I rigged up some LED lights, which I should have done at the beginning, so apologies, and ordered a few things off the internet. As you can see, the difference was enormous. The new landing was going to be approximately 150 millimeters higher than the original, so I had to increase the size of the mortise in this post. It may look a bit sketchy, but the circular saw is the quickest and easiest way to do that. Remember, there are many ways to skin a cat. Steady hands. The other end of the new landing beam is going to sit onto a small concrete pad. So I set up some more shuttering and added some OSB so that the pad would finish 20mm back from the finished wall surface. I then tried to make a small batch of concrete, but made the rookie error of adding too much water, turning it into soup, and then had to wait a few hours for it to stiffen up. 
two hours later. How did you get there? Rafa. Did you jump that fence? Ooh. <laughs> the next day a package arrived. It seems the amount of equipment needed to make these videos never stops expanding. Some of it isn't noticeable, but this new lighting setup was and is a game changer, and it seems so obvious now. But it did mean adding two more batteries to the already enormous charging station I have to keep on top of. But the results should be better videos for you, and that's all that really matters in the end. Then it was off to the two brothers sawmill to pick up the oak for the new landing. This is the same place where we cut up the triangular rafters for the roof if you can remember. Apparently they've just put up their green oak prices for the first time in about a decade. Still very cheap though and you can see the full cost breakdown on my Patreon. We'd ordered one beam and nine joists.
As it was green oak, this beam probably weighed around 100 kilograms, but thankfully the workshop floor is still silky smooth. It's always useful to take a long look at any timbers you intend to be visible, because you want to have the nicest and cleanest faces on show. If you lock the tape at the required length, it's pretty easy to visualise, and it's also why you should order wood at least 10% longer than you need, to give you some leeway if the ends are a bit scruffy. Then I had to cut the tenon to go into that wall post mortise, which you saw me increase the size of earlier. I've had a bit of trouble adjusting the depth on this saw, so if anyone knows a trick to fix it, please do let me know in the comments. And after a quick 40 grit sand, I measured how long I'd need to cut the beam so that it overhangs the concrete pad by 150 mil or so. And it was almost exactly three meters if I remember correctly. So the top and bottom flights would each have to be just under 1.5 meter wide. Once I cut it to length, I started marking out how and where the eight joists were going to sit onto the beam. Pockets were an obvious choice for this, as the other end of the joist is basically just floating on top of the new concrete wall plate, so there's plenty of movement. And it was a good opportunity to get some more work out of this chain mortiser. I don't know how to use this.
Stupidly, I cut all the pockets before trying a dry fit with an offcut, and it was a little too tight, which indicated that the joists weren't all the same size. They would have been identical if the sawmill had cut them all at the same time, so I imagine instead that they put together our order with odds and ends lying about, which is a little annoying. But as the pockets were already cut, I'd have to deal with that issue later. For now, it was time to get the beam in. Unfortunately, the tenon was a little too big for the mortise on the first go, so I chipped some off and we tried again. To fill this new gap in the mortise, I cut up some seasoned oak so there shouldn't be any shrinkage and hammered it in. But I wasn't too happy with the fit of the first one so I whipped it out and tried again. Um, ballast.
On the other end, it was just a simple job of filling in with stones and water. And before anyone gets their knickers in a twist about wood being against Portland cement, that's only a problem if you have persistent water nearby. Halfway up a wall with no external sides should be fine. Now to these joists, but before I could sort out their problems, the workshop needed a good tidy. And whilst you're watching this incredibly thrilling piece of content, please can you do me a massive favour which I don't often get the chance to ask. You see that subscribe button down below, if you click it and the bell, YouTube will send you a notification when I post the next part of this series, and it'll look really good on my CV, so thanks very much. Okay. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do it. Come on, do it. Alright. Now back to these joists. First of all, look at the state of this one. The price you pay for cheap oak is inconsistency. We'd ordered nine joists with one spare and the width we'd received ranged from 86 to 74 millimeters. Yeah, I'd cut the pockets at 75 millimeters, which was lucky, but it meant I had to run all the joists through the thicknesser to get them down to 75. Once I had them all roughly the same width, I went through checking for best faces and also to see which ones were bowed, which was about half. Then I cut them roughly to length, making sure I kept the nicest run of each joist and marked the bows up for later. This was a great excuse to get my slim out and if you've never seen my videos before, it's a minimalist three-part tool belt I designed to carry all the essentials without getting in the way and it's available to buy on carlrogers.co if you're so inclined. Perfect for any DIY projects this summer. So if this is a ratio of three and that's a ratio of four, the distance between that point 
and that point is five. So you just times those numbers by whatever makes the most sense. And then you know it's a perfect right angle. And this is just to stop it going that way. So I always know that if I push it against the wall, it's gonna be square. trying to make sure that all these horrible bits are going against the wall where no one will see them. So this is how much some of the joists were bowed and it's always a good idea to have bow up so any weight on the landing forces it down straining it out. If you have bow down obviously it will only get worse. And that is almost it for part one. You may have realized that this channel has big droughts between videos. That's because I film everything during really intense short visits to France before editing all the footage back home in London. Hopefully the situation will change in the not so distant future and I'll be able to film content every week. But until then, this is all I can do. So part two will be released on YouTube in a couple of weeks and part three after that. But if you'd like to see them now, and personally I think you should watch them together, you can do so on Patreon where they're already live, without adverts. For $5 you get immediate access to this two hour series as well as additional content such as a cost breakdown for the staircase. Patreon is really a community platform where you can also hear about my plans for the channel and to give feedback if you'd like to. So if that sounds interesting, please do check it out. And if not, make sure you're subscribed with the bell clicked so you get a notification when part two is live. But thanks for watching and I hope to see you soon.